Is it working? This is more Sean here. Yeah. They're both looking at the daddy. Grayson, you always look at your daddy with adoring eyes. <laughs> hey, Dad. Ethan! What is it, Ethan? What's that? I can't see. Something in your ear? It's maybe a fuzz. It's a what? Maybe it's a fuzz, Dad. It might be a fuzz? Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting in my dad's room next to the hospital bed that he said goodbye to us on. It is Sunday, January 20th, 2019. The day after the passing of my best friend. I don't know how he did it. Going through every day knowing that the next his condition may very well be worse, and still maintaining a positive outlook. In the hardest of times, he showed no fear. Such a selfless man. He knew that if he was worried, his family would be too. He protected his family at all costs, and I know he will continue to do so forever. When my father was approaching his final days, I told him, I'm sorry, Dad. I don't know how you do it. I wouldn't be able to withstand half of what you're going through right now. My dad replied, yes, you would. Easily. The man I looked up to so much believed in me like I believed in him. The confidence he showed in me gave me strength that will live with me forever. I'm no longer asking myself what if this, what if that. I am now remembering my dad for the amazing man he was during not only his journey while battling cancer, but his journey throughout his entire life. A part of my heart is empty, but I know that that missing piece in my heart is going to be filled by my father. But for that reason, I encourage my heart to make more room. My dad is my best friend and role model. I'm just glad I was able to tell him that as many times as I did. Today is January 19th, 2020. Running a little late, rushing out the door to our first, well, I guess it's our first therapy session since, ever. yeah, ever. First therapy session since our dad passed away last year on this day. So it's been a full year today. I don't know, this whole year's just been a, a battle trying to feel for me. And I haven't been able to like, talk to anybody. Not that I haven't been able to, but I've kind of procrastinated talking to somebody that can help me, I guess, validate my emotions. Yeah. Or more my lack of emotions. So, we're gonna head to therapy. I don't know how that's gonna go. Yeah. This uh, is our first one, but I mean, it's something that we probably should have done a long time ago. Yeah, today just doesn't feel real yet, I guess. Everything that we're doing and everything that we have ahead of us, we haven't been able to process it really. Filming this today is, it feels right. Yeah. It's something I know that dad would want us to do. Yeah. I just don't know, like, he doesn't want me to be fucking sad, and that's for sure. I gotta get better at that shit, bro. Right? Yeah. Okay, 
We kind of just realized that we haven't told anyone that we're really filming this documentary, besides everyone on the team. And we haven't told our family, uh, most importantly. We didn't want to just throw it on them before it was real, um, but it's definitely real now, so we want to let them know that we're, we're going to be filming this for our dad. So we're going to call our dad's parents right now, my grandma and grandpa. Hey, grandma. Hi, Grayson. How you doing? I'm all right. How you doing, baby? Just, uh, it doesn't really feel real, you know? No, I just don't same... even want to get out of bed or anything, Chris. I know, you don't have to. <laughs> I'm just so bad. I'm sorry. It's all right. We wanted to tell you guys that Ethan and I have have been working on um, a documentary that we're planning to to talk about dad's life and everything and the type of man he was and what a good guy he was when he was here and right. because we we know dad loved helping so much with everything he did we just wanted to fill you guys in so we're back in jersey and we'll be filming for the next couple of days okay um but yeah i'm really excited for you guys to see this it's, okay. uh, i feel like okay. i i owe it to dad so all right oh, yes. God, that's so that's beautiful great. thank you guys this is going to be really touching, and it's going to help a lot of people, I think. And it's a lot of people in our situation. That's the goal. You know. Okay. Yes. Yep. I think Dad would love it. All right, guys. Oh. Well, we're going to head to therapy right now, but um, just yeah, if you need anything, let us know today, okay? I know it's okay. good. Hey. Thank you, guys. Love you. Love you, right. love you guys. Love, love you guys so much. much. We'll see you soon. I see. You. All right. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye. Bye. First of all, is what is is bringing you here today, and what is a goal you have? Um. So t today marks the one year since our dad passed away. Something that's been bothering me this whole entire year is that I kind of feel like my dad was our best friend. Um, I'm I was pretty much just as close to him as I am to Grayson. To lose someone like that, and then I I just like haven't been able to like really get emotional or as emotional as I thought I should be like have been able to mm -hmm. like I feel guilty I don't know if I'm afraid to face my emotions head on but we have like each other to talk to but we're both feeling the same way so there's right. nothing we can really right. benefit you know you know first of all I just want to tell you when uh, grieving is a separate journey you know your twins are extremely close but your journey through this is going to be very different Nobody grieves the same. You you are known. This is a you know you went through a trauma, mm -hmm. and when you go through a trauma, there are symptoms like um, numbness, uh, panic attacks, anxiety, mood swings. You could have nightmares, and it's you know that is a very real part of processing trauma. Yeah, I have been having panic attacks, and that was actually something that. My mom always talked about how she would have panic attacks and my dad as well. And that was something that I wasn't fully convinced was even like real. As of like recently, I had like a couple. What does it feel like? Like I couldn't breathe. Yeah. I thought I was having like asthma or something mm -hmm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, wow. Yeah, that's real. Sometimes what it feels like is you're very like passionate about something. But then when you're grieving, you just lose interest. I've lost interest like in a lot of things this year. Like, <clears throat> um, so, sometimes I feel like I can't like even be there for my friends because mm -hmm. I just like I'm just elsewhere. I want you to notice as you go through your day, you know what you're telling yourself. Like I should be doing this, or I should be feeling this, or you know I should be there for other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is that's really asking a lot of yourself. I don't think that's fair. To you. Mm -hmm. to be expecting you to have unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. So you can never quite meet them because you, you it, it's not possible. You need people to be there for you now. Yeah. And that like, doesn't mean you're a bad friend. That's kind of hard for me to accept. 
It is very hard. Especially the type of person that my dad was. There was never a time where he was dealing with something so that he couldn't be there for us. Every time I get upset, I just think about him and that he like, he never let his condition, even, even when it got as bad as it did, like get him down at all or yeah. make him upset. And it was just never about him. I never wanted to be like about me. I, I never cried around him, but I, I started to cry. And just like his emotion when he saw me crying, I just like hated seeing that look on his face. Like he, he was like, like I never really saw him get upset about this because he never let his condition bother him. But like when I got upset, he got upset. Another tough thing was like, since my dad got diagnosed, he never thought that it was going to take his life. And when we got word from the doctors that he had two weeks left, I, like I didn't, I felt guilty to believe them because I knew that he didn't believe them. So you're, you're having difficulty forgiving yourself. Yeah. And that, that's a big piece of accepting loss is forgiveness. Yourself. Yeah. And it gets to a point where like, you see someone you love in so much pain and when you're told there's no way they can possibly rebound, you think, okay, maybe passing away is the best option. So like for me to see my best friend in so much pain and, and the way he was living is really no way to live. Unconscious, then wakes up to throw up, then passes back out. The messed up part was that the only option was either continuing in that phase or death. There was no getting better. And because getting better wasn't an option, like you have to almost hope that they could just pass away in the most peaceful way. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, I had such a hard time accepting the fact that like, some part of my brain was hoping that my dad passed away. And again, you were, you were, it was your love for him. And you know, it's, there are no words really to express what that's like. Yeah. The only times that I've really been able to feel emotions um, are times where I was like triggered by a memory or a memory hit me harder than it normally would. Mm -hmm. And that's happened from photos um, video one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are powerful things. I always, when I work with people who have had a loss, I sometimes they're not ready to do that. Yeah, I just think because I'm so like tired of feeling numb, I kind of I might be ready for that. I think that this is just a wonderful, wonderful thing to do because I don't think in in our culture we talk about death it's something that happens to everybody mm -hmm. and so right. you know it's it's a very unhealthy piece of our culture that i think you're helping to change mm -hmm. which is pretty awesome thank you very much thank you that's the goal this was a great start i think to our journey through this so thank you very much you have a lot of self-awareness and you're like i said you're right where you need to be thank you thank you okay. really appreciate it I just like, coming out of that, I thought I was gonna be a lot more in tune with my emotions, but for some reason I'm just still numb. And I just kinda wanted to induce my emotions. I wanted to be able to feel something today. So I think we're gonna do something today that we've been kind of avoiding for a long time. The first week that my dad passed, I was just always looking at photos and some of them would trigger me. It, it was just too much. And then that's when I got really numb. And ever since then, I've been like avoiding looking at them because I just don't want to not feel anything and not be able to remember. I just like had this huge block. Because it's kind of been happening for us mentally, we put off looking at any photos or anything. So today we felt like we take a big step and look at photos and talk about the memories that they withhold. So we're gonna look through these and do our best to recall memories. This is us and, us and Dad. 
Damn, it's really crazy, like the feeling that a photo can bring back right away. Yeah. All right. It just doesn't feel real at all to me right now at all. Yeah. Like, it's never felt real, and I don't, I don't know when the fuck my brain's gonna be able to process it, but it just doesn't feel like he's gone. Yeah. Like, we'll get these photos, and he's just so familiar. It's just so familiar. Like someone like that's so familiar to you, and then you just like can't see them again. But the second you do, it's just like. It's like you saw them just a second ago. This is when our, our dad was our vice principal. Vice principal. That was the only year that we went to the same school that our dad worked at. But this is the first day of school ever for me and E, and we're having the, sh the same shoes on. And just a little bit different, kind of like our shoes now. <laughs> I remember this night. This is when the Giants won the Super Bowl. We're big Giants fans. This must be a school. Yeah, it's tough, dude. Photos are tough. <laughs> I just fucking hate crying because I feel like <laughs> I feel like he doesn't want to see that. <laughs> That's the tough thing about photos. It's not, it's not that I'm sad, I just fucking miss him, dude. It's like, such a good person. <laughs> he just looks so happy at his job there. His fucking kids took him away from that. So that's why I guess I don't know if we, well I can do this. I guess that's why I've been subconsciously putting off photos because they are they are hard. God. Here's this dude, it's so weird because like I have this photographic memory. And I can remember literally doing this. I, I remember that too, bro. I remember the snowman. We'd start up at that ramp. This is this dash we were in until we were three years old. And I remember going up by that ramp. And that was where we'd start, and my dad would run us down the yard and fling us. Was my dad playing the drums? He taught me how to play the drums. Yeah, I remember um, me and my dad each had a drum set at the house that I grew up in when I was younger. Not this house. Uh, and it was in the same room in the basement, so me, just me and him would go down there. and. We'd have like drum offs all the time. And he had like a big set and I had a mini set. Um, I guess this is a photo from my dad's band. That looks like a 16. Yeah, that is a 16. Festival or something they were playing. He was a singer. And he was our age. And he always told me that I'd be able to sing one day because he could and I can't. <laughs> I wish I could. I can't at all. I think my issue is like that I also don't want to get upset in front of Ethan. So it was really good today to hear the therapist say that like grief is something that should be done you go through your own journey with grief yeah and our whole entire lives we've gone through the the you know we've walked on the same path yeah we've lived synonymous lifestyles because we we're so close and i think our bond is so strong and, and also because of what we do i think because like when we were talking about the extremes there's either complete isolation or there's diving into too many things at once where you can't really focus on your emotions, you're kind of concerned about what's going on around you. I think, like just right now, like my, the minute I got emotional, like my first thought was I need to run out of the room and not be around Ethan. That's what I was thinking. Because he's going through it too, and it just like, and then there's that feeling of anger with myself because I don't want to make him upset. When I talk to him now, I kind of like to think of him as like, more my age and a friend because I guess there's no saying of how old you're allowed to be in heaven, but it just, it's like nice that we're able to experience things on a, on a different level mm. and even closer than we really were ever able to while he was here. 
He's a good fucking guy. Did a lot of cool shit. He really did it all. You know, he was good at he was good photos. at everything he did too, because he did it with care and with love. I learned some new things just looking at these photos for this past couple minutes. I don't know he played the piano. <laughs> I kind of want to go through these photos some more alone. Yeah, we don't have to go through the rest now. It feels good to go through them. That's a good thing. I'm not exactly sure why I was even putting off going through photos. Like, if I wanted to be emotional, why was I afraid of being emotional? It's just so many thoughts that like hit your brain at once and you can't process anything. You don't know what you want to feel or why. Yeah, I think it was just hard for me, especially in the beginning, to like validate how I was feeling and understand that, that it was fine. Mm -hmm. It's easy to feel wrong about anything you're feeling. But just like, I'm, I feel wrong when I'm crying for making other people upset and then I feel wrong for not crying. It's not talked about enough. It's not. So I, no, I just had nowhere to look, no one to talk to. So I'm really glad we're doing this with cameras on, because hopefully. It's hard, but it's worth it. Hopefully someone that, that's watching that's in a, in a dark place like I was can get a little bit of help from this and maybe be able to relate. The most helpful thing for me throughout this whole entire year was just when I learned that I wasn't alone in this and that other people are going through the same thing and had the same exact feelings that I did. Yeah. As hard as it was looking at the photos, um, I like having physical, tangible things to remember our dad. So uh, I went through this bin and I found this letter that I remember him actually receiving in the mail. And we sat down together at this very table and he read it to me. He received this letter from a student when he was sick. And um, I remember being really touching, so I'm gonna read it for the first time in probably two years. Hello, Mr. Dolan, it's David Williamson. I heard you weren't feeling so good. I just wanted to let you know my sister Emily and I were thinking of you and hope you feel better soon. I don't know if you remember my sixth grade trip to Fairview Lakes while I was attending Borough School. I can't believe it's been four years since that day. I had a really scary time that night. I really hadn't ever been away from my parents and I never felt good enough to be away from them for one night. I got really bad headaches and an upset stomach. The anxiety to be away for even one night was overwhelming me. I decided though that I had no choice but to go because my parents would have been disappointed in me as well as me to be disappointed in myself. I woke up that day for the camping trip, put a happy face on and went off. It was going really good until it was time to go to sleep. It was very uncomfortable for me. I was scared. And this is where you come into the story. Remember my mom said, talk to the principal because he was very understanding. She said, you were very caring and had kids of your own. So I took the chance and told you I didn't feel so good. And I need to listen to music on my phone. I needed my gift of music to comfort me. You not only let me listen to music because you understood how I felt. You took the time to sit with me and make sure I was safe and comfortable. You talked me through it all. Even this past spring, I used my music to help me get through my terrible pain. I was on first base playing baseball for Marstown High School and it was the first game of my season. I was very excited because I was voted team captain and I was ready for a great season. During my first at bat, I missed a curveball and my right leg collapsed. I dislocated my kneecap and my leg broke. The next thing I was, I was in tr tremendous pain. You know what got me through my, that terrible night? My music. It was a long night, but the next day came and the pain was a lot better. Mr. Dolan, please take my headphones from my sixth grade camping trip and listen to your music if you get scared. Each day will get better. When you feel you don't get the headphones anymore, please pass them on to someone who needs them. I look forward to seeing you come watch me play baseball this spring because I'm working like hell to get back in the field. Please do the same and get better soon. I just want to let you know the impact that this letter had on my dad and our family. It just, it was really touching when we read it. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Really that. appreciate this. Yeah. It's really special. After David told us the full story behind the letter that he had written to our dad, we were inspired to learn more from the people he had shared his life with. We felt that hearing stories about our dad that we had never heard before could be a good way to bring us closer to him. My name is uh, Scott Roach. I am a longtime friend of uh, not only Sean Dolan, but the entire Dolan family. 
And I just wanted to thank Ethan and Grayson for uh, letting me be part of the uh, documentary today. It means a lot to me. Thank you for being um, here. Just going back, the uh, first time that I met your dad was in the uh, early 70s through Little League Baseball. And, uh, you know, from day one, Sean was always the funniest guy on the team. He was big with impersonations. He impersonated the coaches. He impersonated other players. He impersonated me. Um, he was just a kid that everybody kind of gravitated to. He had a contagious laugh. He had just that million dollar smile and somebody that everybody wanted to be around and hang around. And every time we were together, we were always in stitches. And, um, you know, I was blessed. I lived on the same block as, uh, as Sean. I actually named my two boys, Evan and Sean. Uh, my sister-in-law and my nephew live in the house that, uh, that uh, Sean grew up in to this day. You know, if there was one thing that I could just say, if you, if you think about Sean, you think about his life, he was a real renaissance man. And I said this to Grayson the other day because he was so many things. He was a dad, he was a, a brother, a father, a son, an educator, a mentor, uh, a coach. He was a musician, he was a poet. He, he just encompassed so many different things. And anything that he put his mind to, he was great at. And, you know, even in his, his journey and his, his um, you know, his, his battle with cancer, as I look back and I reflect at all the text messages between me and him, he was always the one consoling me instead of like the other way around. And uh, he, was just, he was just a beautiful soul and a good person to be around. He always made, uh, you know, he just, he always made me feel good. Even in the way things uh, are today with uh, the, the way it kind of turned out with cancer, it didn't stop Sean because he just persevered to this day because he touched so many lives. Anywhere you guys go, whoever you talk to, everybody loves Sean. And, um, you know, he's sincerely missed, but he's certainly not forgotten. And I can, I can feel that he's always with us, you know, even today. Sean was a great teammate. I was lucky enough to uh, uh, compete on uh, wrestling with him and football, and uh, he was somebody that you could definitely look up to, which I did, and uh, he was a lot of fun to be around. As it turned out, our senior year, uh, as the video that I gave you guys, Sean actually scored his, uh, his first touchdown against Wallington, and uh, I know for him it was kind of like a big deal. It was a long run. It was a big night. And uh, it, uh, it, meant, it, meant, it meant a lot to him, it meant a lot for me because he, he was part of the team, he loved it. He was, you know, in this town growing up, football means everything and Sean loved to be a part of, uh, of Heights football. I was going through a really hard time. He jotted this thing down on a piece of paper. He goes, I know you're not feeling too well, so I, I wrote this for you. Here, it's yours. Can I read it? Yeah, yeah please. please. All right. It's called A Fierce Believer He Stands. A true believer he stands, marked to steer the lads he meets from cross conventions of loaded fans, owns all the fairness and plenty, marked to complete those lads he be many, many lives above the timid tribal 20, takes the best of our falseness befriends our day to day. Men who mask him pretend to sit in front of his mirror, but only one comes to bow during curtain calls. A fierce believer, he's throned, crowned to keep the lads he meets, clear from the cross conventions of loaded master plans. To, to me, that meant a lot at the time. And so when I look at this, I, I see this. I see this is not me. Um, and I appreciate his gesture and I, and I love them for it, you know? But what I see is I see that this is, a, this is him writing himself. Mm -hmm. This was himself. This is your dad. I've always kept it with me and he didn't even know. You know, he was a good friend. And this, what he wrote here, I've always seen it as this was him and it was something to live up to. He went on to be a, a, a great man, a great father. He achieved so many, so many things. And, you know, a lot of people achieve a lot of things. And sometimes those things, they achieve mean nothing. Mm -hmm. But what he achieved in his life, every, every single bit of it meant something. Every single bit of it made a difference in his lives, his family's lives, his friends' lives. You know, even the little things that he thought was little. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I saw your dad, um, when I, when I saw your dad before he died, I kind of surprised him with this. 
and because uh, he didn't re he didn't realize that I kept it all these years, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked about it, and it's funny because we shed some tears. Unfortunately, we said goodbye, and then we immediately started making jokes about he yeah. did about things we used to joke about when we were twenty. <laughs> And we started, we, we spent the rest of that time laughing with each other. Yeah. Which is who your dad was. But you don't need me to tell you that, so. You know how close I was with him. He was like a father figure to me. There was times I needed him. He co-signed for my car. I don't know if you guys even know that. I didn't know. <laughs> my parents would have co-signed. I'm out of college. I had no credit. I had student loans. And I call your pops, and he's there in 30 minutes signing. I was like, you know, so he was always there for me. Your dad was like probably like my number one coach. And like to this day, before every match, I think of him. Like before every single match. I know he used to love coaching you and like just like really believe in you and I always did too. He was like such a coachable kid, he's so determined, so disciplined and yeah. he just had a really great time coaching you, man. He had great influence here in Mountain Lakes uh, with the wrestling program and even in the Wildwood School. He really, he, he impacted so many kids. He knew every kid's name. He knew what they did. He knew their families. You know, you knew, you knew when you sent your kid to that school at Wildwood that, you know, they were going to be safe with Sean Dolan there. So. He, uh, I'll never forget him, I never will. I remember like the first Northwest team tournament we won. I remember I was the first match and it was the first time I like ever cried from the match and your dad was there. He just like hugged me and like just told me to go out there. Yeah. And I just kept wrestling. It's it's sad, It's I can't believe it's been a year, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I know he's so proud of you guys looking down and he's, and he's just, just keep on making him happy. You know, our bond's forever. Yeah, you're right, uh, But I miss him and I love him. The last time I ever saw him before he passed was in the summer of 2018. And um, it was after football practice and I was just tired laying around at the house. My dad said that um, one of our family friends was having a party for the parents and he asked if I can go pick up your father. And uh, I accepted right away. I knew he was incapable of driving at the time um, from the illness he was enduring. But then we get in the car and uh, he was saying um, it was always his dream since he uh, drove through with uh, your mother. Um, it was always his dream to live there someday. After everything was said and done, he wanted to live there at some point in his life. It's, I, I honestly didn't really even know that, like, where where he last, you know, where he last lived was the place he always wanted to. Yeah. I know he liked that side of town, I just didn't know that that was always a good dream. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, like he, Cause he grew up near the city and he always like, he liked the country and I knew yeah. that, but I didn't know that like, yeah. that was the spot. So I just like. I didn't even know that. So thank you for sharing. We continued to drive and what seemed like a 25 minute drive at most seemed like an hour long was worth of time. And I don't know, he's just so easy to talk to. And he always connected his like, his sense of humor to every conversation. And that's what like made him so intriguing to listen to and talk to. I remember pulling up to um, the Hills house and got out of the car and he, he gave me a hug and uh, he said, I love you, man. And that was, that was the last time I ever saw him. But <laughs> pulled to the side of the road and uh, <laughs> thanks, man. I really appreciate it, man. I stopped driving for a couple minutes. It's really hard. I think in that car ride, um, when he spoke about uh, how he wouldn't let it get to his head, how he every day he fought to get better and better and keep going, even it was even if it was like a little amount of yard work, he continued to progress every day to where it's more hours on hours on hours to the house that he always dreamt of. Uh, he always told me to believe in myself and have confidence, and that's really how he shaped me today, uh, to have confidence in myself and everything that I do. And, um, and that's, I think, what I'm most appreciative for him for. I'm just gonna start off by saying, like, the moment we met him, he just treated us like his own kids, you know? And we were just so grateful to have him in our lives. And he, 
was just such a good man. And when we got the news that he had cancer, it broke our hearts. It really did break our hearts. And uh, he was just like our father to us. And like when we got that news, you we were just like so impacted by it. And like he's like best friends with our father, or my dad. I'm sorry, you're right. When my dad got diagnosed with cancer, <sighs> your dad was just so like helpful for us, and he was just always there for us. And even though he had cancer too, and he he was fighting, he always made sure that you know we were good and you guys were good. And I mean, a month later, when my dad passed away. I mean, Joe and I were just so, so broken, so, like, we just didn't know what to do with our lives. And Your dad was there to help us. He was a father figure. Their relationship really showed what, I mean, what I, Joe and I want to be like when we're older, what we want our kids to be like, and... I feel you guys, the best fucking role models, you know? I mean, when we got the news that we were in Florida, I woke up and you texted me that your dad passed away. I was just, I was like, why? I was like, why, why us? Why you guys? This shit happens to like such good people, you know? Yeah. And it really yeah. broke us mentally. You know, I feel like that brought us closer together. And Definitely. yeah. I think that's what our dads wanted us to do. Be strong for them and take after what they, you know, modeled us after. Definitely, man. Yeah, thank you guys for being there for us after we went through it. Well, thank you for being there for us too. All the stuff that he was saying, like, felt like it was coming from a friend, but also had like the maturity and the wisdom of something like that you would hear from a dad. And it just felt like really nice to like see that Mr. Dolan as like a friend too, like an extension of just like yeah. of you guys. He he loved when you came over all the time. and was like, yeah, Cordell's awesome, and he was a big fan of you and, and when we hung out and shit like that. So that's sick that you say that. So I was getting physical therapy for my torn ACL and all of a sudden um, the, my physical therapist was telling me that she had something that I may know. And then all of a sudden I just heard your dad coming from behind me saying, Cordell! And I was like, <laughs> what? And I just meet him like me was like talking and catching up and that was like after he had like all the tattoos that he had. And so that was really cool to see him since I hadn't seen him for a long time. I, I do really feel like when we all hung out he was like, a third, like a third friend, you know what I mean? Or like an extra friend. Just like cool to hear things like what happened at physical therapy, you know? I would have never known because I can no longer ask him, but like, it's just cool to still learn about him. And it's been a tough year for me personally, because uh, the times when you would count on seeing that three o'clock in the morning text and now it's not there, it's yeah. kind of tough. Yeah. For me, it was when we moved in, I guess, and it was at probably one of the block parties. He was like, dude, we should do stuff. And then I think I became like your dad's scapegoat with your mom. Because, <laughs> as you know, the Porsche. Shortly after my dad got sick, if anyone didn't know, uh, he met up with Todd and he secretly bought a Porsche. A little rusty, a little rusty, a little rusty. He secretly told me into buying it off of oh. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was, it was, Good times. He, he, had, he had all of the ideas. So he helped me. Um, you know, my son has some, you know, like issues as far as learning and those sorts of things. And your dad his education background taught me a lot about it. That made me feel better about things. So I always remember that also. Um, it meant a lot. He, he, would, he would go out of his way for you, you know, and we would for him too. The last year has been, been tough just because, you know, like I said, you're the times you expected to hang out. Like I go to some of the same spots we used to hang out by myself yeah. now, yeah. just because I want to, you know, feel his, his presence. And I felt it a few times, to be honest with you. We all know your dad, obviously, from Tall Kappa Epsilon fraternity down in Glassboro. And, um, you know, through that fraternity, we became closer than friends. We became brothers. He was a, a, a diligent guy. He got a job on campus. He was working in the bookstore. Now, a little thing about our pledge, pledging is we, stre we, we stress togetherness. You know, by the time there's a bunch of guys that don't know each other, by the end of their pledge ship, they're best friends. And it's our job to get them there to keep our fraternity tight, which is why we're still sitting here now. So when we were off campus or we were looking to like have some fun with the pledges, they were hard to find because they were always scurrying around and hiding from us. 
All we gotta do is go to the bookstore and get Dolan. <laughs> I just remember him, he's just always just a freaking solid guy. Like there's few people in this world that are solid. Like just good, good, down to earth soul people. And that, that was your father. Like you can't, you can't get much better than what, he's, what, he, what he brought to the table. And every time you were with the man, he always was uh, more concerned about how you were doing yeah. than what he was doing. That's true. And it was bewildering to people because when you, you're going through something like he was going through, you would never know it. Because he yeah. talked to you like yeah. everything was cool. Right, right. Showing me his tattoos, we went out in his Porsche. He's like, woo! You know, he's doing his bucket list, obviously, in hindsight. And also, canoe trips. <laughs> we organized a June canoe trip where we go down to Delaware, and he showed up for the last three. And he was hurting. And I was in that canoe with him. And it almost <laughs> fell smoking off. cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm yelling at him, I'm like, Oliver, cut, put the butt out. You're gonna give him cancer. And we're all like, ah! yeah, because that's how we work. I mean, you he's know, like, I already got the cancer. Yeah, Don't he's worry like, about and your dad's looking at me like, you know, he's giving me an eye, eye like, get him out of my bowl. So I never planned on going to the Audi. I never got a room in AC. <laughs> I would just go down on the fly, sleep in my car if I had to. I was that guy. But your dad always got a room. He was that kid that always got the room. Had the car figured out. He's gonna, and he would always call me up. He's like, you want in on the room? I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'm going, whatever. Yeah. Sure enough, that day I would always call him up. I'm like, hey, you got a room? He's like, of course, you can, you can stay in the room. So I go up in the room. I go into the room at three o'clock in the morning. I'm a gambler, I'm not sleeping. I go into the room at three o'clock in the morning. Your father's sleeping on the floor with a pillow and a, a blanket so I could have the bed. So I could have the bed. I go in there, I go, Don, what are you doing? I can't come in there. I get in the bed. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. You could. He's that kind of guy. And he bought the room. And he bought and the he room. Bought the room. And I bought the room. Yeah. I bought the room. No, no, you get breakfast. You know, <laughs> he was just that guy. But uh, yeah, it was a rough road in the end for all of us. Yeah. For all of us. But you would never know he was sick. He didn't know. Never know he was sick. The other thing I really admire was that he he, he followed up on his book. Yeah. In writing the books, that was very you know, and that helped a lot of kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. he went around from school to school, and I was following him on Facebook while he was sick, going around and helping people with actually publishing his book. You know, a lot of people say they're going to do something. He did it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's that. That's that's Sean. Yeah. That's Sean. So this was his office. I feel like his desk might have been there. I don't, I don't know if I remember. Last time I was here, I, I was probably like 12 years old. But this is where Ethan and I used to come visit him on Take Your Kid to Work Day. Um, that was our day that we wanted to get out of school, you know? So we definitely took that opportunity and we came to his school. <laughs> Dang, it really feels like yesterday. I was sitting here playing with like a Rubik's Cube or something like that. It still looks like his office. Like it did when I when he was the principal. Wow. We met in this building, okay? We were uh, hired together the same night. Sean was hired as principal, I was hired as superintendent. And we hit it off right away. Uh, and then we found out that we actually coached in the same school at different times <laughs> with different people. So we called each other coach as a result. And that's where that came from. We did a lot of things together, con contacting each other. And we even got sick together. He got cancer right after that I did. He helped me through. <clears throat> I get a little choked up thinking about it, but he really did a lot uh, when I was going through what I was going through. And I was trying to help him as well. Uh, we contacted each other right to the end. And uh, I really felt that he was a great friend and I miss him terribly. He's smiling somewhere. I think what strikes me you know, most about your father was that uh, he, his involvement, his people skills were like above and beyond. I mean, I'm, I'm a people person and 
I have a good memory. I, I think I remember lots about lots of different people, but your father always, uh, he knew every kid's name in this building. He knew a story about everyone and he knew it quickly. I love your dad. He was a, an amazing principal and person. The day I met him, I kind of made a fool of myself. It was over the summer and I came to get the library mail like I always did because I'm a nerd. And um, I went into the office and the secretary said, oh, um, the new principal's here. And I see this guy just dressed very casually. And I, and I went up to him, I said, oh, have you seen the new principal? He said, I'm the new principal, I'm Sean Dolan. And I said, I thought you were the summer help. <laughs> <laughs> and we shook hands and I thought, oh no, I'm doomed. But um, just from then on, he was just so supportive and present for everything just always present for whatever you needed. He was literally the wind beneath my wings. Just a really, really great guy all around. Well, your dad had such a vibe. Yeah. You know, when you meet someone and you can just feel their positive energy. That's what I felt from him the first time he walked into this very room. And on the very last day of school every year, he would take a table and put it outside his door and who collect our keys and give us our last paycheck, shake her hand, tell us to have a good summer. And we we're all like, what is this? Like Sean's lemonade stand? And he was like, ha welcome to Sean's lemonade stand. So the following year, he brought lemonade and he got on the PA and he was like, attention everyone, make sure you come to Sean's lemonade stand and come, you know, hand in your key. And it just grew, it became this big thing. The next year he had like see and lemonade and it was like so funny. And it was just the cutest way to like, send everyone off. It was perfect. Recently, another teacher had approached me and said, you know, I, I think we need to do a memorial mural outside of his old office. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. She's like, will you run it? And I was like, yeah. She goes, I think it should be a lemonade stand. After Sean retired, he reached out to me and he said, hey, Kirsten, what's up? You know, I, I wrote a children's story. Would you like to illustrate it? And I was like, of course I would. And then something that stood out to me, which was funny, there's a character in there. I think his name is Blaze Barnstone or something like that. I illustrated him, I did the character mock-ups and he was like, can you make his jawline a little more square? And I was like, sure, Sean, sure, no problem. <laughs> Whatever you want. And if you read the book, you'll notice the, the opening page is the last page and it's also the back of Burrow School. We would have meetings and he was like, Kirsten, Kirsten, this is gonna be big, it's gonna be big. We're gonna go on tour, or we're gonna have a tour, it's gonna be called Sketchbook Live. He had this whole plan and uh, he wanted to make this whole thing where we would go to different schools and talk to them. He was just so thoughtful in everything that he did. This whole project brought him a lot of happiness. Um, after he retired, he, I told him he should really focus on things that made him happy and uh, he wanted to write a book to share with children and go on tour and read it to them. Um, and he did? He did, yeah. So thank you for making that happen. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. He made it a point. He was going to know every single student and every single parent. So he would wait outside, like when the buses were coming, and a lot of parents would drop off kids. So he would greet them, introduce himself, got to know every single parent, and then at lunch, he would go in and sit with the kids. So, you know, he, he could tell you the name of every student within a couple of weeks. He taught everyone that it doesn't matter what position you're in, that everybody plays a role, and that we all need to work together. He, he was a true believer in that. And uh, then even last year, we did a walkathon in his honor, which we will continue to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you, Thank you so much. His heart was always in for the kids. And I think that's what he did with the, um, the talent show. And he did I was drums. just gonna say, yeah. He, so my husband and him um, had this idea to just surprise the kids at the end of the show. So they were the closeout and your dad and my husband did a little drum battle. And so they were just taking, you know, turns back and forth, you know, doing what they're doing. But the kids were all standing up. I was fangirling in the audience too. <laughs> and I was just like, it was the best thing because the kids have talked about that for years. Personally, I got to um, play some golf with him. It was for a student, a charity in, in remembrance of a student that we lost, unfortunately, battling cancer. 
there was a putting contest. It was the toughest putt you could do, but if you got close, you could win some money. So I thought I was going to win because I was like four inches. She's and we're, extremely close. And we're sitting at the, <laughs> sitting at the <laughs> table and does. they're announcing the winner of the putting contest and it's Sean Dolan. And I'm like, you couldn't make a putt the whole day we were out there. You're hitting them on the roof and you win this putting contest. <laughs> and we're just laughing hysterically. He goes up and he didn't even accept the money. He turned around and he gave it back to the organization. No matter what got in his way or what you know, no matter what was hard for him, he always wanted everyone else to be strong and he was always focused on everybody else. Your dad always just really listened to all the big ideas that we had, but he always wanted to see those things through and a lot of things he did. He, he just, did. he, he always tried had big ideas. So it's been a full day since we talked to all of my dad's friends and employees and people he's coached and our friends. And it's really so crazy what you can learn about someone, um, even though they're not here anymore. That to me was one of the best forms of healing that I that I've been able to practice since he's passed. Yeah. And not gonna bullshit, it was tough. Um, it dug up a lot of emotions and things that I was thinking about all night. Things that kind of kept me up a little bit, but I, I enjoyed it. It was the only time I really felt any satisfaction from grieving yet. Learning all those things about my dad that I'd never known before kind of showed me how similar I am to him. And it felt like he was here. It did feel like he was here. There's endless amounts of information that we can keep learning about him. And I feel like that brings his spirit to life even more. I'm really excited for our family to watch this portion of the, the documentary and to see all the amazing things that he's done and the impact that he's left in every community that he's been a part of. And just, I don't know, I think it'll be a good way for them to heal. So today, we want to keep learning more. So we're gonna go talk to our family. Today's gonna to be hard. Yeah, for sure. It's gonna be really fucking hard. Hey, Grandma. Hi, guys. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandma. Hey. How are you? He was just a lot of things, your father. He was just a great guy. And I miss him so much, you know? Because sometimes I I feel like I should call him, and I can't, you know? He was a, he was my friend, too. Yeah. You know, he wasn't just my son, he was my friend. Yeah. And in the last two years of his life, he got even closer to him, you know? Yeah. And I wish I could have got even closer before that, but he fought through everything. He always wanted to be independent, and he never put his burden on anybody. He was that type of guy, you know? And this is what your father was. He was like, he was gallant, you know? He was like true blue. He was like a Marine, you know? Always loyal. He would do everything to make things happen positively. He never felt sorry for himself that he was real sick like that. The last time we went to the hospital with him, um, it was a, there was something going on in New York, and your father just started crying in the car. And, you know, I'm in the back. I'm trying to, to soothe him. I said, Sean, what's wrong? He said, these people are making such a big deal about this nonsense that's going on. When in New York, they were supposed to have this rally for kids with cancer. He was so upset, but he was crying because of the little kids that have cancer. And, and, and they want to live another day. And these other people are, are, are protesting and fighting for nonsense, absolute nonsense. And nothing that's important than a little kid wanting to live another day or my son wanting to live another day. He gave me strength. 
strength. He really did. To keep, he was sick. I remember. To keep going, he was, he was just so strong. He fought to the end. That's how strong he was. But what he gave me is strength to understand what's going on, what life is all about, really. Mm -hmm. And I try to think every day that I'm trying to do the best I can, Sean, so I don't, I don't hurt your spirit by just mourning constantly. Okay. I'm trying to just keep going on like you would want me to. As faith, like unbelievable faith, yeah. where I didn't have it. I always had it, but not as strong as I do now. Unbelievable, the, the amount of faith I have in him and his spirit in in what I believe now is stronger than whatever I believed in. Because yeah. yeah. I took from him that, and maybe that's what he left me more than anything, more than material possessions or anything, just the spirit a belief that I'm going to see him again, yeah. you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to be with him again. Yeah. I'm going to miss him forever until I'm not on this planet anymore because he was my child. I just want to say I'm really proud of you guys for being this strong. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Even, even, though, even though I'm your grandkid, yeah. and, you know, yeah. but three I, generations younger, I, I'm so proud of you guys. Well, thank, thank you. you I really, and I want to let you know what you guys know, whether you know it or not, your strength rubs off on me. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. Good. good, thank you. Just like his did. Yeah. I just love you too. Yeah. I can even tell you how proud of you too and, and Cameron. You were everything to him. Come a long way. You guys Always. worked your way up too. That's all part of the deal. That's part of the dolens. The whole topic over Sean was selfless. He was never worried about himself. He was worried about everyone around him and their well-being more than himself. When I struggle, I think about him and what would Sean do? And what would Sean do? He'd plug away and go forward and try harder. It's kind of like my motto now, just keep on going, just keep on pushing and things will be okay. You know, it's tough talking about him. It is. It's just, it's just tough. I call his voicemail still, just to hear him, which is tough, but in honor of him, it's about pushing and going and moving on and forward. Yeah, wow. Sweet. That's what he did always. Yeah. It's all he did. He never complained. The day before he passed, he, he said, I'll be all right. Yeah. And I looked at him like, you'll be okay. And to me, it, it put me at peace a little bit that he's not worried about the next step. Yeah. He was my older brother and he pushed me and I thought about him all the time. He was a jack of all trades and a master of all. I stay positive, your father would not let me slip, slip down, your father would not let me slide no matter what. He would always stay on me to be, to always work out, to always be in shape, to always be tough. Even when I was in college, he had the best talks with me that anybody could. And I think that his belief that he had in all of us is what Honestly, keeps me going now that he's not here. You know, I always say he's still he's still doing it for me. Not only better yourselves, better other people, better other people around you. Inspire inspire greatness in others. You guys are always those people. Your father was that person, always. If you're asking me, what impacted me the most was as as you guys know, Sean and I had talked a lot during his process as he got sick and going through all this horrible shit that knocks your brains out. Being 72 years old, I've been around men that have passed and I've seen guys react differently. I've seen one guy die as angry as I've ever seen him. I've seen other guys die like mutes. And Sean was, he did not, he didn't only get out of the dugout, man. He took the fucking bat and got in the box. I guess what I'm trying to say is he was the strongest guy and I'm saying it says a lot. This is in my, my, my bones and my heart. Every time I hung that phone up with him and paid attention to his attitude and really understanding, as we all knew how serious it was, and so did he. But he didn't act that way. He didn't act that way. Was, I can't tell you guys, man, how, how much it impressed me with that whole background that I had 
and watch real palookas, real so-called tough guys, fold up like old beach chairs when they hit the wall with something this is serious. Not him. Apologized to me because he had a puke in a fucking pan. Sorry, Uncle Joe. And he said that to me, I wanted to jump through a window. Sean, please stop. Walk him to the bathroom because he had to stop and lean on the couch. Sorry, Uncle Joe. Oh, man, Sean, please, man. I hope and I see in you guys that strength, that toughness, that man, that's a man. A guy that strong, polite, aware of everybody else. And I'm telling you, man, firsthand, I've seen a lot of guys go. And when I would drive home, I'd say, man, when my time comes, if I get something laid on me like this, where I linger, please give me 10% of what that fucking guy had. 10%, because I don't think I could do it. I mean that. And I think a lot of myself. I got a fucking ego, I've been up against it. But I've never been up against that. Sick, sick, and aware of everybody else. Yeah. Prior to that, Writing books for kids, going to classes, classrooms and doing all that shit. Nah, Sean was a special guy, man. Special. The sad part about special for me is, you don't know it until shit like this happens. So much goes over your fucking head. If I could do it all again, all over again, man, and I hope it happens to you guys, everybody in this fucking room, is you pay attention every day you got. Pay attention, dig down deep, know who you're dealing with, know and appreciate what's good about them. Square them up when they're wrong too. Step on their balls. But just pay attention because man, you don't want to see it all near the end. And that would to me, Sean, that was the true essence of what he was and who he was. And none of us would really know how sick he really was when we saw him on his feet. But can just imagine because I heard through the grapevine that bone cancer was painful. It was the worst. It was the worst. He had the worst and didn't act the worst. So you ask me about him, what I think about Sean. I only hope that I could be that much of a man. I don't say it had to be dramatic. These are my feelings. I made a mistake the other day. I get this guy I got to call, his name is Sean Hogan. And I dialed Sean Dolan. And I heard his voice message. And that fucked me up for two days. So if you ask me, man, I never have forgotten it. I think of it. Weekly, weekly, I think of it. So impressive. But, and I think for me, because of my upbringing about all that macho shit, that's all fucking horse shit anyway, because it ruins your life when you get caught up in that too much. <clears throat> to me, everybody that mattered to him in his life was around him. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a real gift. What he fought. I've been around a hundred deaths, at least. Never, 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 ever seen anything like that. It just racked me to my bones, man. I think hearing a story that we don't know about our dad from our mom. Um, it's gonna be really nice to hear, but at the same time, definitely the hardest. She, she wanted to make a contribution to this documentary for my dad. Um, I know she feels really strongly about that, but I just don't. I just, I'm afraid that it's gonna be too much for her, so. You guys head out for this one. Thanks, boys. Appreciate it. Thanks for doing this, bro.
I feel so much more comfortable in this room than I have this entire shoot. Me too. Like, I feel good. Like, a lot of the times I was like, I don't know if it's just because us three, but it could be the room. Mm -hmm. Like, here, it feels good. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Do you know what we've been filming with everybody? Have we told you? Mm -hmm. Like, what we've been asking and stuff? No. Just like stories about dad that we've never heard before. I've learned just through, we talked to so many of dad's friends and co-workers and a lot of the stories were very similar because he was such a consistently good person. Mm -hmm. But I learned so many new things about him. I mean, even if it was just like a goofy story, like I can think about it all day long, you know? Right, it's nice to have new memories. Because you Sometimes it feels like, like memories not fade, but when they're there for so long, they stick around and then when you think about them again, you don't get that like raw emotion, but when, when you you hear something new that you've never heard before, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're experiencing it for the first time. And it's almost like that they're not even gone because you're experiencing something new with them. So I was wondering if you, and I know this could be really hard, and we could practice it and I want to keep doing this, but if you had any stories about you and Dad, because you guys have been the, you guys were together for, you know, how many years? I was thinking I was with him more yeah. years than I wasn't with him. Of your life. God. <laughs> I was doing that today, it was 35 years. No, it just hit me because, like, it's unfair that as we, we live on, like, that number is going to change now. <laughs> like, I, haven't, I haven't been able to cry so long, even with you guys, though. Yeah. And I think it took this. Yeah. We were never going to sit down and do oh, this. Yeah. This has been so fucking hard and draining. But like it feels so good. Yeah, I think it's part of it. It feels so good for it to feel real again. Cause I don't. When it never. I mean, at some points, I feel like I never even knew him. And even now, it doesn't feel real to me. I feel like we're just. He's in the other room. We're talking about it. We can't even feel like you don't know your best friend anymore. Maybe you don't know. Cause it stops feeling real, and you get so numb that you don't even remember them. And it's the first time that it really has because I dug up so much during this documentary and although everything's stirred up and my emotions are crazy, I could like feel like he's here and I could miss him again. It was such a natural gift to him that he didn't even realize that he did it. You know what I, know. I mean? He didn't do it with intentions of doing it, it's just who he was. I know. You know, like and where it'd be even you can talk about going to treatments, but you know, the lady at the who answers the phone, the lady who you check in at the desk, the person who's driving the car, I mean, the proton radiation, you know, knew the guy's name, the first, like, he always greeted the past name, yeah. greeted everybody with the first name. <laughs> the, the ladies who did chemo, everybody's like, oh, I, just, I think it lit them up when he came in. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, we haven't had a conversation like this this past year. Not once, sitting this close to each other on the couch talking like this. I don't think we talked about that in a group like this. I haven't, I've done it with you and I've done it with you, but I haven't done it with you too. Mm -hmm. I just hope he sees this video so he really knows how many people he helped and how worthwhile his, his life and everything that he did was. Because he had all these things that he wanted to do for himself and he always talked about them, but he pushed them to the side always. If you think about it, that, we always were like, well, why don't you just do what you always talk, you always talk and we, talk. But he, but he was pushing it to the side, not because he didn't believe in himself, believe himself because he didn't prioritize himself. He didn't. We gave him shit for that. We did. We were Remember, like, like oh, you, you want a pizzeria? You're going to open a pizzeria? He had all these dreams opening these restaurants and doing music tours and book tours, and he pushed them to the side, and we always gave him shit for it. But it was that's just because he... Was on he purpose. put himself under here. Always. Well, I always he said that. He wanted to do stuff for other people before himself. I always said 100% without a doubt he'd jump in front of a car and train for it. And he was without hesitation. And I feel like with his always. with his sickness, he, he did that in a sense. Where he was feeling like he got hit by a fucking train at times and he didn't say anything about yeah, it. He complained once. 
for us. Yeah. And I just, you just want to Bravest, think. bravest guy I know. Mm -hmm. Never once complained. Yeah. He really got to do everything he loved. But the fact that he could spend so much time with you, even looking at the video, it's like he was there for everything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the most important thing to him. Yeah. He said he didn't have any hobbies. You guys were his hobbies. I know. He's going to be so happy doing this because I do it all day. And I picture him, he's going, yes! Because <laughs> he's so proud of you guys. Love you. I'll talk for hours. Love you, Mom. Craig or Pug? Sorry. I don't say sorry anymore. I know. Love you. I love you too. Love you. I'm saying sorry. I know. I'm supposed to be here with you. Jesus. I know. After hearing all these amazing stories about her dad that we had never heard before, from many different people that he'd lived his life with, we realized that they all had one thing in common. He was always helping. We're starting this cancer foundation. This has been something I've, I've wanted to do for a really long time. Same. And I just didn't know when the right time was gonna be or you know the proper way to do it. But we have been working really hard on getting this thing organized and to be able to make the difference that we've always wanted to make and the difference that our dad would wanna make. Would wanna continue to make. We partnered with um, EIF. Basically what EIF does is they allow people like us to set up foundations and um, target causes that we really believe in. And that are really personal to us and our family. So we had a meeting with EIF back when we were in LA and we kind of explained all the ways that cancer directly affected our family and those who we care about. Um, how it affected our dad and then also ways that my dad would like to help people. That's what Love From Sean is. So when you donate to Love From Sean, all of the proceeds are going to be distributed to all these cancer organizations that we um, really, really have a strong personal connection with. It's just things that, are, that were real to us, things that we really went through. And these charities are fighting these problems and trying to find a solution for the families and the individuals that are suffering from this horrible disease. So for the first charity, I want to start off by sharing a statistic. About 1.7 million people are diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. per year. And in the U.S., there are about 1,500 cancer centers. It's just heartbreaking to think about all the people that are sitting at home because they have no way to get to these facilities. Now, luckily for my dad, he had a really loving family uh, and, and, and friends that would take him and be able to drive him because he, he didn't have the ability to, he lost the ability to, to drive and to walk. Because the medication he was on and because the cancer spread to his brain. There's some people out there that can't get there and they just have to sit. Fuck, dude. It breaks my fucking heart, man. He said to sit there knowing that this disease is in their body and it's gonna take them and they have no way to fucking get help. They don't have the money to get there or they don't have, you know, the vehicle or the, the, the person, they just don't have the resources to make it to these, these care centers. And they just have to sit there and just live with the thought that this disease is taking them. So the first charity that we, that our foundation Love From Sean is aligning with is gonna help these families and these individuals who are battling this disease get to these treatment centers. For charity number two, um, I want to start off with another really disturbing statistic. Um, 9.6 million people are diagnosed with cancer worldwide. Every single year. 9.6 million. That's larger than the population of New York. Wait, actually, fuck, dude. 9.6 million people worldwide die due to cancer. Every single year. Every single year. 
And for my dad's situation, it's not only affected us five, it's affected his family and his extended family, the, the members of my mom's family, all, the, all of his friends, all of his students, all of his faculty members, and that's almost in the thousands. Yeah. And that's just one case of cancer in one individual. People don't realize how terrible this disease is, not only for the person battling it, but for all those around that person who care about them. Sometimes losing someone to cancer can leave a family in a really unfortunate financial situation. My dad had cancer for about two and a half years, and by the end of his the road in his battle with cancer, he received close to, if not over, three million dollars worth of cancer treatment. It's three million dollars. There's families out there that can't afford that. The second charity that Love from Sean is going to be partnering with helps to get these families who are dealing with this trauma into therapy sessions to grieve and receive the proper help they need. The third charity that Love from Sean is going to be partnering with is Stand Up to Cancer. Um, I want to share another statistic again. 206 people have been diagnosed with cancer since you've started watching this documentary. And every single day, about 5,000 people are diagnosed with this horrible disease. It, it doesn't feel right that this, this, we're just letting this disease outnumber us. Yeah. We only have, more people are diagnosed in, in a day in our country than there are facilities to help those people. By making this documentary, it was part of my goal to, to spread the awareness of this fucking awful disease so that we can outnumber it. Yeah. Because right now it's outnumbering all of us. I just wanted to tell a quick story. Um, so a year into my dad's battle with gastroesophageal cancer in the fourth stage, he had gone through chemotherapy, he had gone through radiation, both forms of cancer treatment countless amount of times. His body was breaking down because of the treatments and there was just no way that we could continue. And there was no other treatments left chemotherapy stopped working and, and radiation stopped working. So when you hear that your dad has two weeks to live, I mean, just it really just sends you into shock. When I heard that, I just prayed for at least another week with him. <laughs> By a miracle, there was a treatment called immunotherapy, which had just been passed for his form of cancer. So this was a trial drug. Um, basically a trial drug is they're always coming up with new treatments uh, for this disease. Because of cancer research and charities like Stand Up to Cancer, they're always actively trying to find a cure for this disease and new treatments to help these people. And it was, it was my dad's last bit of hope and our family's last bit of hope. So my dad began with immunotherapy after he got passed for his form of cancer. About a week after he was given two weeks. Yeah. And soon after starting immunotherapy, they started to see a very large decrease in the amount of cancer in his body, in his, in his tumor, uh, where his cancer started from. And it looked like he was on the road to full recovery, you know, just a week after he was given two weeks to live. Just because of that one trial drug. And because of that one trial drug, we got an extra year and a half with my dad. And for about nine months of that year and a half, he was able to live symptom free. One point where they found so much cancer in my dad's shoulder that he couldn't lift his arm up anymore and his bone was gonna shatter from it. So he was gonna have to have his arm amputated. And I remember he just was like, fuck. He was like, fuck dude, I'm not gonna be able to like have a catch with you anymore. It's like throw the football around. Um, so he said, I'm gonna have to start learning how to throw with my other arm. Um, and then about, you know, a couple months after immunotherapy, I was hanging out with him and he, he picked his arm up and he was able to move it around again. So Stand Up to Cancer is doing amazing things for, these, for cancer research. And that's why we decided to partner with them, with the, the foundation that we've created with our dad. So the fourth cancer organization that Love From Sean will be donating to is Sloan Kettering Memorial. 
Um, that is the cancer center that my dad got all of his treatments at. And it is actually ranked as the number one cancer treatment center. In the U.S. In the U.S. So. We are so fortunate to have lived 15 minutes. 15 from minutes. From the nearest Sloan Kettering Memorial. They're really supportive of their patients. And our, our family as well. They um, would check up on us and ask us how we were doing, even after losing our dad. This is a very special organization in our heart that we're going to donate to. So they can continue to save lives and give families and individuals extra time here. Together. Together. The fifth charity that Love From Sean will be donating to is St. Baldrick's. St. Baldrick's is a charity that is fighting to end childhood cancer. Um, it was always the hardest for my dad to see children fighting the fight that he was fighting. And as we learned at all the schools that my dad either taught at or was a principal or superintendent at, um, he was all for the kids. So for my dad to see, you know, children who he, he sees playing outside and uh, learning new things and, you know, just growing up, um, having to have all that stripped from them because they're battling this terrible disease that he was battling, uh, it, it was extremely difficult for him. And another really cool thing that St. Baldrick's does is they have head shave drives, um, which is to, you know, raise awareness and show solidarity with these kids and kind of uh, take the stigma away from losing your hair. The one time I saw my dad insecure in his whole entire life uh, was when he lost his hair to cancer. He was like, fuck, man. I feel like I look sick, dude. Uh, and I think it was because he didn't want people to think that he was losing hope. Like he saw himself being bald as like, oh, people are gonna think that I'm kind of giving up or I'm fading away. And I was like, dad, it's just hair, man. And uh, at the time I, I thought about shaving my head for him and I talked to him about it and he was like, no, no, don't do that, it's fine. Like, he'd be upset. He was, I'll be upset if you did that. I don't want you to do that for me. Like, I'm, I'm battling this thing on my own, it's fine. But he was really appreciative and I should have just fucking done it. So, um, for these kids and for my dad and everyone who is losing their hair and, uh, feels you know, from that. feels alone or upset from that, I'm gonna shave my head. Those are all the charities that Love From Sean will be donating to. So when you guys donate to Love From Sean, these are all the foundations that will be receiving your proceeds. All right, Greg, can you come clean it up for me? Yeah. Holy shit. Hell yeah. I think it looks pretty cool. I fuck with it. Dude, I like I it. I like it. <laughs> All right, let's go, clean it up. I think it looks sweet. Clean it up. It does. Dude, I've always wanted to like do this. Okay. I can't believe I actually did it. Look at this, Gray. <laughs> My hair was so long. That's a lot of hair. So much hair. You got a lot of scars, bro. I know. Like all in the back. All right, easy, easy. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be so much easier to have this haircut. Right? Yeah. 
I'm kind of jealous of not gonna lie. Oh. I'm really happy I did this. I'm really happy that I have a story that I'm proud of when people ask me why I did it. Oh. Love you, bro. Good, bro. Love you, bro. Looks good, bro. Thanks, man. It actually does. Yeah. Like it. No, I like I, it. I want to get one. I like it a lot. I'll clean you back up a little more. All right, thanks. I did a good job. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Although the pain of losing a best friend will never go away, we've made a lot of emotional progress while filming this documentary. By continuing the conversation of her father's life, we have found a way to keep our bond with her best friend girl. We came across her dad's old cassette from when he was in a band when he was our age, and we wanted to listen to it for the first time. your donation to Love From Sean, visit lovefromshawn.org or click the donate button below. No donation is too small. If we all team up and make a donation, together we will outnumber this horrible disease. Your donation is going to save lives. I'm filming you filming me. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so good, dude. Thank you. I'm really proud of you. Love you, brother. What do um, you think? Dude, you crushed the look. I think you should wear it full time. Honestly, I want to keep it. Eight plus. A plus, yeah. You've got this twice before, right? No, I've got it twice. Oh my god, it's insanely good! Yo! <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna get emotional. It looks amazing. That's tough, though. That looks awesome. Thank you. Whoa! <laughs> That's wild! That's not what I expected! You look great! Thanks. Alright, let me see. <laughs> Who is that? Oh my god! To start off the foundation, Ethan and I are making a personal donation of $50,000. So we wanted to kick off the foundation in an epic way, so we got a big check. Yes. Official. We're going to drop this off at EIF. We're going to have to fit that thing through the trunk. <laughs> Fits in the elevator. Barely. <laughs> How are you doing that? Good, how are you doing? I know, I thought you were so Holy heck, that's, that's so cool. How are you? Hey, it's so good to see you. Oh. Official. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get in. I don't want to get in. Welcome to the show.
got. Hey, you're feeling too deep for what you got. 